for Krimer Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, Professor of Economics at Stellenbosch University, Johan Puri, discusses his book titled, Our Long Walk to Economic Freedom, Lessons from 100 Years of Human History. Why do you think it is important for people to read about the economic history of South Africa? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I've been teaching economic history for, for a decade, so I, um, I certainly think it's important. Why I think it's important is that I think there are kind of three reasons why we want to understand economic history. The first is that, of course, economic history tells us a little bit about where we come from, our identity today, how we think about ourselves. And we are simply interested in, in where we come from as a society and as a people. Um, but I think um, there are two other important reasons that, that needs to be mentioned. And the first is, that the past explains how we uh, developed um, and grew as a society. And so if you want to understand things like poverty in South Africa today, if you want to understand things like unemployment or inequality, it's impossible to understand those things without understanding South African history. And the third reason I think that uh, the past is important is that it's often analogous to the present, that we can take history lessons, see how things played out, and learn from those perhaps mistakes that we were made back then, and you know, uh, not make those repeat those same mistakes today, uh, and improve perhaps on on the policies that we uh, set for the future. And in your book, South African economic history is woven with wider African and global history. Tell us about some of the linkages that exist between South Africa and the rest of the world. You're right. Um, there's a lot of linkages, and the one reason that I try to highlight this is that it's often when we study economic history or history in general, it's often uh, very separate from other parts of, of the world, even the African continent, but certainly kind of globally. And so I wanted to address that in this book. And so, uh, you know, it's, it really starts from chapter one, where we, where I explore the kind of uh, out of Africa migration and uh, moves along quite kind of quickly. We we see in, in a later chapter, for example, when I talk about pre-colonial uh, economic systems in Africa, we see interactions with you know, the Mediterranean. We see the adoption, for example, of maize uh, across the Atlantic. Um, there's a chapter on uh, how Africa is connected through the Indian Ocean trade networks to the Arabian coast, to, to India, to China even. Um, and those links came all the way down to South Africa. It's not a, a history um, where we only see kind of global interaction after kind of the colonial arrival of, of Europeans in the, in the mid 17th century. It's, it's, a, it's a very deep history of, of kind of uh, long distance, uh, what we would today call international trade networks. So, so South Africa and Africa's history is certainly not separate from global economic history. And you also reflect on some unlikely links, such as that between Einstein and Eskom, and between that of the late Zulu King, Goodwill Zulitini, and the ninth century European leader, Charlemagne. Tell us more about those relations. Yeah, I, I think um, partly the reason I, I kind of mentioned those links is that, again, we, we kind of think of history as this you know, place that are kind of separate from us, uh, both uh, you know, in terms of time and in terms of space. And in fact, there are many different things that, that still happen in Africa and in South Africa where we can learn again from the past and see how those types of institutions, for example, played out, uh, how they were perhaps beneficial to some and not to others. And we can predict what might happen with those similar kinds of institutions today. So the Charlemagne example is one where I look at kind of feudalism in in you know, Europe and, and how that worked, the kind of relationship between the king and, the, and these you know, princes and, and the serfs uh, that, that worked the farms and how those relationships might be very similar to what would, one would find today in the kind of former homelands uh, where you had a very similar system of property rights. And, and so I think that is, uh, you know, if you, if you bring kind of the past into the present, that helps us to understand why it is important to study uh, those kind of historic lessons and, and how we might learn from them today. Briefly explain to us why agricultural-based societies require a far more complex social hierarchy than the hunter-gatherer societies. For most of our history, 
uh, humans who are hunter gatherers living in you know, small groups, uh, roaming the countryside, maybe between you know, 30 and 50, 150, perhaps the biggest groups. And then through a you know, long kind of process, uh, some of these groups, uh, especially in the Middle East, uh, transitioned into becoming farmers, uh, agriculturalists, and perhaps climate change contributed to that, the, the change in the availability of, of resources. And so some farmers were forced to, to uh, adopt some of the kind of grains that we still consume, you know, rye, oats, uh, wheat, barley, these kind of things. And so they domesticated those kinds of plants and animals. And that obviously meant that uh, that some of those farms, those households then could produce a much bigger surplus than what was the case uh, when they were hunter gatherers. Um, and, and that uh, process of producing a larger surplus meant that uh, it created a far more sophisticated, in that sense, society. So suddenly you could have specialization of certain skills. Some would be farmers. Most of obviously the individuals in the society would be farmers, but others might specialize uh, in say iron working, or they might be soldiers um, because you wanted to protect that surplus. And so you see the kind of the emergence of, I guess, what one would today call uh, civilization. So this kind of uh, bigger uh, societies, uh, obviously the surplus also allowed larger populations. Um, it allowed trade to, to occur and uh, one needed to protect again those surpluses. And so you, you also find a kind of social hierarchy developing with kind of kings and priests at the top um, and typically kind of the, the farmers uh, lower down. And so it's obviously a form of inequality that was introduced in society. A more equal society was the hunter-gatherers where, where everyone would typically do you know, all kinds of tasks. Uh, whereas in, in, in these new farming communities, you find a more unequal uh, situation also even within the family. So many, uh, of these households uh, now saw deeper specialization where the, the husband would, would typically you know, take care of food production on the farm and, and the uh, wife would typically be in charge of you know, taking care of the children, which, which wasn't as specialized as it was before. And so you also see these high levels of inequality in, within, within the household um, happening. And so that's really the emergence of, of the kind of society that we are far more familiar with today. And the study of economics is mostly concerned with why the market approach has been so successful in solving the three economic problems. So what does the market approach entail and why has it been so successful? Typically we think of um, the economic problem as doing, having kind of two types of economics, uh, economic problems. The one is the problem of product, uh, production, so they're producing enough things. The second is the problem of distribution. So uh, making sure that those things that we produce are distributed fairly uh, to, to everyone in society. And there are three ways to kind of solve that. The one is the custom or tradition approach, which simply means that you do what your ancestors or your parents did. The second is the command approach. It's basically there's some uh, dictator or autocrat in society or command council perhaps that, that tells uh, its citizens uh, what to do, what to produce, and how to, to distribute that production. And the third one is the market approach. And you're correct to say that that's exactly what economists are studying. And that is really where everyone is free to produce and consume what they want. Uh, and the way they decide on how to produce and consume is to react to the price mechanism. And that price is set through market competition. So. So everyone competes for the uh, products and services that are produced in society. Um, and you know, the you know, most un um, successful entrepreneurs succeed, they produce a profit, and the profit is really a signal of that more should be produced of that thing. And if you don't make a profit, then of course, less should be produced of, of that thing. So the market mechanism is a wonderful way to allocate um, tasks really in society, and then also as a way to distribute those things that are produced. And what has been the aggregate effect of the Land Act on Black Living Standards? There's a chapter uh, about Saul Plyke's journey in South Africa, and the, and the purpose really of that chapter is to discuss uh, the consequences of the Land Act. Um, but more than that, really, it's to look at kind of living standards uh, across the 20th century. And, and certainly, um, if we just focus on the Land Act, uh, one should remember that that came, you know, in 1913, 
after already you know several decades of land dispossession, certainly kind of in you know what was then the Cape Colony, but also later on you know the rest of of South Africa, what later became South Africa, the Boer Republics and and Natal, and so really the Land Act almost just cemented something that was already happening at that stage. And so, you know, there's various scholars that talk about what were the consequences of, of the Land Act. I think at commentators at the time, including Saul Plaik, he thought that the, you know, the Land Act would have devastating consequences immediately. And, and perhaps, you know, we don't see those immediate consequ uh, consequences uh, uh, following the Land Act. Of course, there were other things happening in the world, like the First World War and, and, and so forth. Uh, but certainly over the longer run, we know that that kind of dispossession that had happened or at least the uh, inability of black South Africans to own land uh, after that in, in, in most of South Africa uh, meant that that kind of exclusion that happened uh, uh, prevented social mobility, economic mobility from happening. Um, and, you know, it's only 100 years later almost that, that we could see that that was reversed. Um, and the way we try and capture this uh, as economic historians, often because we don't really have the kinds of sources we need, uh, you know, we don't have wonderful censuses back then that includes black South Africans, for example. So the last one that, that does that is the 1911 census, and then there's, you know, there's large gaps in between. Um, and so the way we try and do this across time is to look at other kinds of, of measures of living standards. And, and one way one could get at that is to look at the heights of a society. And so um, anthropometric history is the study of basically heights across time. It's you know used uh, everywhere in the world. I guess the kind of classic example is is the height of individuals in uh, in the Koreas uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the height of North Koreans were uh, equal to the height of South Koreans, and today South Koreans are about six centimeters taller, right? And that is because height is not only a genetic trait; it's also a environmental it's a consequence of environmental factors. And so if your environment improves, if the nutrition that you uh, receive as a, as a child improves, then you are likely to grow taller on average, right? And so that's exactly what we measure across time. And so we can show that in the period after uh, the Land Act, in, in fact, even before, as I just mentioned, there was obviously some disposition happening before, we see a decline in the heights of black men. Um, these are, of course, children uh, we record then they are adults, but when we trace them back to their birthday, that's that's around the 1910s, 1920s. But by the 1930s, you see an increase actually um, in in the heights of, of black individuals, and that is because South Africa leaves the gold standard. Um, the price of gold increases massively. There's massive uh, uh, increases in employment uh, on the mines and, and higher incomes, and also social services, for example, Soweto is built in the 1930s. Um, and so uh, you do see this kind of correlation between um, the, uh, what we know of kind of the economic history factors and um, the living standards of black South Africans. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's an attempt to, to test uh, empirically what we, uh, the hypothesis that we, you know, we, we've set uh, for ourselves. And what can be done to help improve the South African education system? I've got many colleagues that are far uh, better experts on the South African education system than I am, and, you know, and they are doing a wonderful job at trying to understand which policies need to be implemented to, to help alleviate what is certainly a, you know, a crisis at the moment. I, I would want to add that there is, you know, that crisis has persisted since, certainly since I've been a student in the early 2000s. We discussed the same kind of issues that we have today, and in fact, some of those issues even though there's some improvement, they are still incredibly bad. So, so I, I want to kind of argue in the final chapter or so of the book that we need to also think of alternative models. And, and one of the models, you know, that's related to economic freedom is to say, uh, we need to give individuals, certainly parents and children, the opportunity to choose to which school they can send their kids. And so there needs to be, again, competition in the market for schooling. At the moment, schooling is almost entirely dominated by state provision schools, right? And so if we provide choice, if for example, we can say to an entrepreneur in a township, you can create your own school and then kids can uh, you know, come to your school perhaps, uh, pay with a voucher, which the state still covers, but now it's not the state providing the services, it's actually an entrepreneur 
who has the incentive to provide adequate and decent services. Um, a great example is, you know, there's, there's Curo just opened, I think, a Delft school, which is roughly, you know, uh, uh, priced at, a, at about 20,000 Rand per individual per year. Now, that's exactly the same amount that the government at the moment spends on schools. So if Curo can just provide a far better service, a far superior service than what the state can, now kids in Delft can actually choose, do they want to go to the, to the um, state funded and, and state operated school? Or do they want to go to a Cura school, perhaps if the state was willing to give them a voucher to pay Cura? So I think there are multiple of those innovative options that one should explore. And the kind of purpose of it all is really to give choice, to give people the freedom again to choose the type of services and, and products that they consume. Most people, especially Africans, are still living in poverty, unable to achieve the life they want. So do you think the country's future is bright enough for everyone to enjoy their economic freedom? Well, um, you, you're certainly correct that uh, you know, poverty is still a, a massive issue in South Africa and it's, it's uh, certainly in the last decade, uh, it's become worse. Um, so um, so it's, uh, the book is not certainly intended to, uh, to suggest that our long walk to economic freedom has ended. There is still lots to do. It is an optimistic story, though, that you know, if we look at the long run, we see that there has been an improvement. And certainly in South Africa, you know, post 1994, we know that it's a country that has that can basically this this the last 25 years or so um, can be split in two. Really, the first the first part we see this massive improvement in living standards and, and reductions in poverty. And during the second half, really, so since about 2008 nine we see actually a, a kind of decline in, in living standards. So I think um, partly the book was written with the aim to say, um, most of my students certainly are very negative about South Africa because they're basically their point of reference has only been the last decade. And so they've only, had, they've only been confronted with this negative story, but there is actually a positive story to tell. And certainly if you look at it over the very long run, over the hundred years or 200 years, we see an improvement. So I think one can be positive. But this is certainly not a prediction that things will turn out correctly. I think that I, I want to distinguish between those things. There's reason for optimism, but it's not an inevitability. Um, a lot of things can still go wrong. And so partly the hope of this book is that we also learn from the things that we did wrong and try to uh, address them and implement the policies that would allow more econ and greater economic freedoms for even the poorest in society. And lastly, what needs to be done to put the country onto a growth path that helps to build a better life for all? Yeah, um, the, I, I guess there are many, um, you know, specific policies that I that one could could discuss. Um, but I I, I want to kind of take again uh, one step back and just look at the kind of broader picture. I think you know one of the things we learn from from history is that humans have really come to the kind of realization that there are two things that matter. The first is that we should use our understanding of um, nature, or one could also call this, you know, our scientific approach, to help us become more productive. So we learn uh, about new technology, well, you know, learn about science, and that science helps us build new technologies, and that those technologies help us become more productive. Um, and that's higher productivity means that we can produce more things with less, right? So that's that's really um, uh, an important and vital belief that we have as a society. And, and on that mark, unfortunately, I think South Africa is spending less and less, for example, funds um, on on scientific progress, even though we still have kind of a world class university system. So I would want us to to keep on focusing on you know this technological innovation that that's that's key. Um, but secondly, I think the realization that humankind has come, come to is that uh, in the past, a lot of those uh, new technologies and in increases in productivity has been extracted by an elite um, or certainly cordoned off, right? So the elite has kind of expropriated um, all of those uh, surpluses. And the realization is that actually, no, that should not be the case. Um, these improvements in society should be for the benefit of all. And, and if I think of you know, how that could apply to economic policy in South Africa today, I would say that we need to give, especially the poor, but everyone in society, access to the kinds of uh, things, the kinds of resources and assets that would allow them to become productive. So 
you know, to translate that into a very specific policy, um, things like ownership of assets, ownership of housing is incredibly important, right? Um, and of, unfortunately, in many cases, both in the rural areas and in urban areas, especially townships, the individuals who live in houses uh, and on, on land often do not own that land for those houses. And so ownership, establishing ownership right uh, is, for example, one of the policy that's it's difficult to implement, but it's vitally important. Another would be to say, well, you know, uh, trans transaction costs uh, are very high in South, in, in, in South Africa at the moment. And so that could be alleviated through a variety of means, perhaps better investments in, in transport infrastructure, but also just, for example, providing free access, Wi-Fi access or fiber access uh, to, you know, marginalized or impoverished communities. Um, so those kinds of things where you really uh, empower people with uh, the assets that, that, that would allow them to become economically mobile, I think are incredibly valuable. Uh, and encouraging competition in society. So, you know, we've got a, a state provider of electricity. It doesn't need to be that, that way anymore, right? In the past, it made sense to have one big power plant. Now we have solar panels. So again, one can empower, say, rural communities with solar power or wind power, other kinds of renewables that would allow them to produce things with sustainable techniques and have access to reliable power sources that, that in many other African countries are also um, lacking. So it's, it's really to empower individuals at the bottom with the resources that would allow them to become uh, productive that I think is, is, is vitally important. And so every policy that we design as a society, we need to think whether that really uh, creates economic freedom or it removes economic freedom. If the state provides things and there's no competition, often actually those policies remove economic freedom. They don't provide them. And so we need to think of, you know, do we actually empower people at the bottom with the economic freedoms they need? That was Johan Fouri speaking to Krumer Media's quality about our long walk to economic freedom.